Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, hand over now to Stephen Kistler from Harvard. He's our next speaker, and um, he'll be talking about the BBC Pandemic Programme. So hello, Stephen. Hello. Hello. Um, let me just get the screen share set up. Um, let's see. Looks like you all can probably see my speaker view, yeah. but not the slides themselves. Is that right? Uh, I can see your slide. Yeah. Okay, great. Full screen? Yeah, full screen. Excellent. Okay, well, that's working better than I expected. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I want to just say a quick thank you to the organizers. Um, Flavio, Ed, I've uh, been in contact with Don and all of the others who have helped put this together. It's really exciting to be here. Um, and again, I think this is a, an incredibly important topic. Um, thanks also to Brooke for kicking things off. Um, I wanted to echo one of the points that she made at the end. Um, but on the flip side, that as, as a modeler, I also can't really imagine doing my work in the future without the input of behavioral scientists. Um, up until this point, that's exactly what I and many of us have done. Um, but I don't think really we can do it any longer. Um, and I think that that's going to come up at a couple of different points in this, uh, in this talk as well. Um, so I get the great opportunity to present on some work that I took part in, um, but this was really a, a, a quite a large uh, collaborative effort um, to put together a, a new data set um, that captures human interactions on a couple of different levels. And this was done in collaboration in part with the BBC and a documentary that they were putting out in 2018 about pandemic preparedness. Um, it turns out that that was a lot more prescient than any of us hoped it would be. Um, and, uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the program itself, but especially the data that we collected, um, some of the findings from that data, and then also some of the opportunities that I see for taking that sort of data forward, uh, for getting a deeper understanding for how people behave um, in the ways that are relevant to the transmission of infectious diseases. Um, so once again, um, you know, I've, I've worked on this project, but Petra, Maria, Andrew, Hannah, Adam, and Julia all, you know, um, have, have their fingerprints all over this stuff too. So uh, for a bit of motivation, um, I, I wanted to start with uh, just a brief overview of some of the things that we already know or knew about human movements and interactions um, in the epidemiological space. Um, so this, of course, is not an exhaustive list of studies, uh, but I do think that they give us sort of a rough sense of the types of studies that are available and were available prior to, to, to the COVID-19 pandemic and to this BBC pandemic study. Um, so the first has to do with quantifying long-term movements of people. So this, this study on the left um, by Amy Wasilowski and colleagues uh, is using uh, mobile phones to track how people move about, um, in this case in Kenya, relevant to the spread of malaria. And so these are capturing long distance movements to try to understand how malaria spreads um, across something on the, on the degree of a country. In the middle, um, we come to the well-known Polymod study, uh, which was looking at how people interact uh, according to their age groups. And so you can see this canonical, uh, what we call a tri-diagonal structure, where you're most likely to interact with people of your own age group. But then there are these off-diagonals where adults are interacting with children and vice versa. Um, and so this age structure uh, helps us to understand the age structure of the transmission of um, especially respiratory illnesses. Uh, and you can see that there's some variation. These these four plots depict the results of this study from four different countries. So even though the overall patterns look the same, this begins to help us get a sense for why transmission dynamics might look a little bit different from one country to the next. And then last, there are these very fine scale studies that look at relatively smaller populations, but use um, things uh, like cell phones or RFID tags to understand how people interact um, on a very interpersonal basis. So this is a network that was drawn between college students and professors who took part in this study um, to infer friendship network structure. So each of these studies has different sorts of um, limitations and benefits. And one of the things that we hoped to do with the BBC pandemic study was to sort of bring all of these things together in some degree. Um, so the things that we primarily focused on are the data type. So um, we wanted to have a data set that looked at both mobility and age structure within the same population. Uh, similarly, we thought that it would be useful to conduct both a survey-based study and a mobile device-driven study 
so that we could understand how people's self-reported behaviors matched up with the actual behaviors that we measured through their cell phone uh, trails. And then the last thing is the data scale. Um, we really wanted to find something that could bring together within a similar population, both something on the interpersonal level and the large scale geographic national level. Um, so we just, uh, rather than coming up with something totally new, we just kind of wanted to combine as much as we could of the benefits of these different studies and see what we could find for the population of the UK. So our, our approach to this um, was actually not initially our idea, um, but the, the BBC and this production company, uh, 360 Productions, were, were decided they wanted to put together a documentary on pandemic preparedness in the UK. Um, and so through some of the early conversations about this, it emerged that we were going to conduct some sort of citizen science experiment that would feature in the documentary. And the basis of the documentary would be that um, essentially we would talk about pandemic preparedness, but then the central narrative feature would be a simulated epidemic in the UK that would start in a specific town just outside of London. Um, and then we would use the data that was produced by all of the volunteers, all of the participants in this study, um, to build a data-driven, somewhat contrived, but nevertheless realistic model of how something like a pandemic respiratory pathogen could spread across the UK. Um, so both to spread awareness about pandemic preparedness, but also to, uh, to gather a data set that would be relevant and important to the scientific community. Um, so this is uh, the, the advertisement for the documentary. It was aired in March of 2018 um, and lists uh, some of the many other collaborators that we worked with. Um, both in, in the BBC and some of the production and visualization companies as well. So how did this work? Um, so we worked with a team of app developers uh, to develop the BBC Pandemic app, um, which participants were encouraged to download onto their phones. Um, and then they had the option to take part in two different studies. So if you were in the UK, you took part in the national study. And if you were a resident of the town of Hazelmere, um, which is just to the south and west of London, uh, you could take part in that study as well. So I'll talk about the national study first, because that was the one that was really giving us the insight into these bulk national scale, long distance movements of people across the UK. Um, and this is what the first uh, couple of, uh, of windows in that app looked like. Um, so to go into a bit more depth, um, once you clicked on the national study, it said, I uh, give you a bit of background information on uh, pandemic uh, respiratory diseases, um, that a global pandemic of a highly infectious disease is likely one of our most immediate threats. Um, and the motivation for the study that we were trying to collect an anonymous data set about he how people behave, interact and travel. And so the, the, the study was basically capturing how far people traveled and how many contacts they had in a 24 hour period. So trying to combine that national scale data with something like the polymod type data. So you click on the national outbreak and so you're asked a few basic questions and then the app tracks your movements at hourly intervals to the nearest kilometer for 24 hours. And at the end of those 24 hours, you were asked another survey about who you had interacted with, what their ages were, um, and a couple of basic demographic information, that sort of thing. Uh, so this third pane is, uh, is the first slide. So it asks your age, gender, occupation, how many people are in your household, um, and then just a rough sense of your health. Um, this last one was not actually something that we included, but it turned out that people wanted to answer this question because um, they were expecting questions about health in a study on pandemics. Um, and so we had to include this to make it more credible that we were actually working on a study. But it actually turns out that this information was a bit interesting as well, because we could correlate behavior with how people felt on a given day. Um, and then it tracked your location for 24 hours. And so here's um, a rough sense of the composition of the data that we got out of this portion of the study. Um, a lot of these slides were put together by Petra um, Klepak, and, uh, and so a lot of um, you know, this, this, uh, this part of the work is really all due to her. Um, and so we had the national study, uh, we had a reasonably wide age distribution. Uh, we couldn't include people under the age of 13 for privacy reasons. Um, we have this big spike at age 25 because that was the default age that was in the app. And so people who didn't put in their age ended up at 25. So you end up with that large spike there. But otherwise, we have a reasonably wide distribution, certainly under representation in the older age groups, um, but otherwise a pretty widespread. Um, I think it's interesting to look at the distribution of contacts that people reported. Some reported a vast number of contacts. They really just put in um, some some people even put in on the order of two to three hundred. Um, amazingly. Um, but you know, this, this distribution sort of roughly captures the sort of uh, maybe gamma-shaped distribution you might expect of numbers of contacts. We can really quantify this now. 
Um, and then the map here gives the uh, locations where people um, made their first, basically where they downloaded the app and made their first location log. So we can imagine that this is a rough proxy of either home location or work location, since those are the places where a person was most likely to download the app and, uh, and get it started. Um, and you can see on the right, this is just a map of population density across the UK. This is not data that we gathered, but they match up relatively closely where we have definitely higher representation in places where more people live. So uh, one of the things that we can do is we can pull out this polymod type um, information about how different age groups interact with each other. And we see this um, canonical at this point tridiagonal structure here. Um, we collected both uh, information on physical contacts. So anything like a handshake or closer physical contact that involved touch versus all contacts. So anytime you were in sort of conversational proximity with another person. So the all contacts are, as you might expect, a little bit more diffuse, um, but nevertheless sort of show the same type of structure. Uh, one of the great benefits of this study is that we could also break down these contacts by home, work, school, and other contacts. So um, if you're interested, there's, there's a preprint on MedArchive that contains all of these data. Uh, I think it's really interesting to compare the work um, and home contacts where you have a very clear tri-diagonal structure at home, but at work, you're much more to likely to have um, interactions amongst adults, but the age distribution is a lot more diffuse. And so this begins to help us understand how a contagion might spread in different venues, um, which is really important for trying to understand how uh, business closures, school closures, um, stay at home orders might affect the spread of a pandemic respiratory pathogen. Um, a lot of these data did feed into the, uh, the response of different countries, especially the UK, in trying to uh, build some of their policies during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we also were able to collect data on uh, behavior in the week during the week versus during the weekend, which I think is really interesting. Um, so I think one of the clearest ways to look at this is the third line down uh, for schools. Um, you can see that younger age groups have a lot of interactions during the week, but far fewer during the weekend, which is roughly in line with what we would expect. Uh, work interactions are also much higher during the week for the older age groups and much lower during the weekend. Um, so really this sort of aligns with what we might expect, but allows us to quantify this in ways that we weren't able to before. Um, and then in terms of the last things that I want to bring up on the raw data for the, uh, uh, for the national study uh, has to do with the, the location logs that were captured by the mobile phones. Um, and so what these plots represent are essentially the probability of being further, being further than M meters away from home or the first place where the person downloaded the app uh, during a given hour. And I think there's some interesting heterogeneities to look at here. So uh, first we see that uh, in the top left, um, adults tend to travel further than other age groups um, and kids tend to travel somewhat less. Uh, we're not really sure what to make of this, but there's uh, from a self-reported gender breakdown, there's also a difference where um, the males tended to travel further, at least during the period of this study. Um, there's more travel during the week than during the weekend, um, and also during the day than during the night, as one might expect. Um, I think one of the real values, oh, and then last, um, people living in rural areas tend to travel further than people in urban areas, and uh, probably in part because things are just further, further apart, and so you have to travel further for the same sorts of things um, when you're living in a rural area. So I think one of the values of these plots is that it tells us both um, how these distances traveled differ between different populations, um, but also the ranges in which these differences matter most. Um, so looking at the rural urban breakdown, for instance, um, we can get a rough sense that uh, if we're looking at very short distances, there's maybe not much difference. And if we're looking at distances over 75 kilometers or so, maybe there's not much difference either. But models that are uh, trying to incorporate movements within that scale of under 75 kilometers might be very sensitive to this type of difference where, for example, at 25 kilometers, there is actually a reasonably large difference in distance traveled between rural and urban areas. Um, and we can see similar sorts of things here. So this gives us a sense of how much, or basically how important it is that we incorporate some of these different factors into the models that we're building, depending on the spatial scale that we're interested in. Um, and then I lied, there is one last thing on here. So uh, this previous slide was just looking at distances up to 100 kilometers, but then we can ask about longer distance jumps. So this is capturing the origin in blue and the destination in orange of trips longer than 200 kilometers. Uh, once again, these seem to match up with places of high population density. And so we were able to extract from this um, a couple of highly, dense, highly connected areas um, where long distance jumps are especially likely. 
And so we can build all of this into a mathematical model of disease transmission. And again, this is what we included in the documentary. So it's a bit contrived. We needed to really ramp up the infection rate um, so that the epidemic would take pace, place over a short period of time, um, just for the sake of the narrative of the documentary. But you can imagine using these data um, in sort of more uh, sophisticated ways to actually inform pandemic response. So in the model that, uh, that we ended up building, um, we looked at short distance transmission that was governed by the mobility data, long distance transmission that was governed by these long distance jumps, and then within patch dynamics that were governed by the age distribution of contacts. And so uh, you can just run a simulation based on this, um, and red points here represent where infection is showing up, basically the prevalence of disease. And so you can see these interesting patterns where there's a bit of a wave-like spread, which actually mimics what we saw during the 2009 H1N1 flu pandemic. But there are also these long distance jumps, for example, from London to Scotland, where um, there are sort of these exceptions to the rule of wave-like spread. Um, and in many ways, these actually matched up pretty well with what we saw during COVID-19 as well. Uh, and then the last point on this is that these models also allow us to do some of the things that we were interested in doing during this current pandemic um, by looking at how different control measures might affect the rate and prevalence of disease. So here we were looking at just reducing the reproduction number by, by a small degree. Uh, we were looking mainly at hand washing here, um, but the ability of an intervention like that to really slow down this wave of transmission. Now, of course, this is beginning with a reproduction number uh, that's in line with what we expected for flu, but of course, much lower than what we're seeing for sars cov too. Um, but nevertheless, the principles still hold pretty well, and this allows us to sort of quantify how interventions might affect the spread of disease. So in the last few minutes, I want to talk about the fine scale study that we did. So this is the second part of the study looking at interpersonal interactions at um, close proximity within the, the town of Hazelmere. So this is a town of population 11,000 or so. Um, again, to the southwest of London. Um, and uh, really, the, the motivation behind choosing this particular location was first ex its proximity to London, but also because one of the producers had uh, some close relatives there. And so it was a lot easier to garner support among the, the people of the town for, for participating in the, in the study. Um, Here's a picture from, uh, we had an event uh, sort of revealing who had been infected in our simulations. Um, so these are a number of the participants, along with Hannah here, who, uh, who was one of the hosts of the, of the documentary. Um, so this really, this study couldn't have been done without all of this input. Um, we really had a wonderful time working with the, with the people who were involved. Uh, I want to give a rough sense of what these data look like. So rather than looking at just pinpointing a person's location within a kilometer over an hour, this is really quite fine scale data. So we were tracking people's locations basically as frequently as their phones would allow us to with as much precision as the phone would allow us to. So each point here represents a person who's being tracked by the data and um, uh, starting at 6 a.m. And we're basically going to see the town of Hazelmere uh, waking up here. Um, so there are little trails behind these dots as people start moving around. And so people are more or less still asleep. But as we move into the seven o'clock into the eight o'clock hour, we start to see people getting into their cars and driving around, um, going to work, uh, going to the coffee shop and such. Um, and so these are the sort of data that we have available, which is, which is really wonderful. Um, this was one of the first times we were able to get these kinds of insights on the level of an entire community or an entire town, as opposed to something like a classroom or a university setting. Uh, of course, this gives us a lot of data, but a lot of that data is not very complete, um, can be quite messy. So to clean up the data, we binned the data into five minute intervals. Uh, we only kept participants who were in Hazelmere for at least six hours, since that was really the, uh, we wanted to restrict our study to that particular town. Uh, we kept only daytime recordings, um, and we uh, restrict it to pairwise distances under 50 meters. Now, as you can imagine, these data um, on their own uh, could compromise anonymity. Uh, and so one of the things, one of the motivations behind this was uh, trying to reduce the data to a set where it was no longer identifiable so that it could be useful to the broader research community um, without you know, having to surpass you know, huge degrees of permissions and, uh, and ethics approvals and such. Uh, so even these restrictions left us with uh, 469 participants um, with 576 records each. So these are the five minute intervals over the course of three days. And the three days included a Thursday, a Friday and a Saturday so that again, we could capture differences um, in uh, weekday versus weekend sorts of behaviors. 
Uh, so one of the things we can get out of this is a contact network. So one of the ways that we tried to visualize this was uh, here. So a node represents a participant. Um, each line represents an encounter within 20 meters during one quarter day. Uh, the lines are colored according to which quarter day that interaction took place. And the area of each node in this graph is proportional to the total number of encounters. So we can see there's a lot of heterogeneity first in the number of encounters that people have, which you might expect. Um, and we also see this very clear structure where, for example, there are small groups of people who are tightly connected to one another. You might imagine that these are households. Um, and again, these dyads, these pairs of nodes that are tightly connected. But then there are these also very sort of long connections where people are connected to people in disparate parts of the graph. Um, and so this already begins to give us a sort of narrative of how an infection might spread on a network that looks something like this. Uh, I think potentially a more illuminating way to look at these data is as a dynamic network. So here we have in the top left, the full network. Um, so anyone who was in contact uh, within 50 meters now um, for, for the top 50 most connected people in the study are depicted here. And then this top right updates by day and bottom left by hour, bottom right per 15 minutes. And the, this, um, the color of the line is proportional to uh, the proximity of the interaction. And so I think one of the interesting things that we can see here as we run this video forward is that really these interactions are pretty dynamic. So when you break down to the scale of 15 minutes, um, the interactions are quite sparse, despite this densely connected network in the top left. Um, and I think that one of the, the takeaways here is that if we fail to account for the, the fine scale temporal structure of these interpersonal contact networks, and we only account for hourly or daily or you know, aggregate contacts overall, we can really miss um, misestimate the direction of spread um, and the degree of spread that takes place at any given time. Uh, so I think that this is going to be a really interesting area going forward to try to understand how we can incorporate these kinds of very dynamic interpersonal contacts into our models of infectious disease transmission. Uh, we can do some summary statistics for these networks. Um, going to go quickly through this uh, just to be aware of time. Um, but in these plots, we're looking at the top left degree distribution. So how many contacts do you have? Top right, the clustering coefficient. So if you are connected to two people, what's the probability that those two people are connected with each other? So basically how densely connected is the graph? And then in the bottom, the graph volatility. So when it's higher, it basically means that there are more connections being made and broken. And when it's lower, it means that those connections are more stable over time. So essentially what we see is that uh, people tend to be connected with more people and those connections are more densely connected during the evening than during the day. So that's parts A and B. Um, but the connections are more volatile during the day. So, uh, and you can imagine that's probably related to going to work and going to lunch and such that these connections are happening, but they're being made and broken a lot more frequently during the day. So this just gives us sort of a snapshot into the overall sort of statistical dynamics of the network itself. Um, and then last, we can build an infection transmission model over the top of this. Uh, so if this is a person who's incorporated in our study, then here's a person who's infected showing up. And you can imagine building a model where the force of infection is related to the distance and the time that people spend together. So now this person has become infected and can go on to spread infection to others. And we can simulate this forward, for example, here. So we have this infected person. This is what we just saw, but now on a wider scale. Now a few people are getting infected and then they can spread infection to others. So once again, since this epidemic was taking place over the course of a couple of days, we really ramped up the force of infection to sort of give this artificially rapid transmission. Um, but one of the big questions that we have that I'm, that I'm thinking about moving forward and that I'd love your input on is how do we take these kinds of data and translate them into something that's more relevant to the spread of an actual respiratory infection? So one of the ways that we can do that um, is to, uh, well, before I go into that, these are just some of the outputs from the models, so just looking at um, cumulative infections and we can build transmission trees. Uh, it's having this full information about who's interacting with whom really allows us to build these trees in, in, in quite good detail. But what can we do with this? So, so one of the things that we're really interested in doing is looking at how do we optimize our vaccination strategies? Uh, so one of the things we looked at with these data is um, you can imagine an, a whole range of uh, vaccination strategies. And ideally, you might want an optimum. Um, it, theoretically, you might want to ask, you know, who's, who's the optimal subset of people to vaccinate if you only have enough vaccine for, say, 10% of the population to slow down transmission? Uh, it turns out that the number of combinations of strategies that you could have for vaccination in that context are huge, um, much too large to run through rigorously um, through a brute force sort of algorithm. 
So what we did here was just looked at a number of plausible vaccination strategies, uh, where we look at the people who have um, the most contacts on all three days, days one, two, and three, um, the most long duration contacts, um, and then all sorts of different things looking at uh, sort of how connected people are in terms of their reproduction number, um, different sorts of algorithms for selecting uh, the most likely spreaders. Um, and what we see is that when we look at both the final size, where lower is better, and the time to 50% infected, so higher is better, that basically means a slower outbreak, um, a lot of these strategies perform relatively similarly. Uh, the one on the right is the no vaccination scenario for reference. Um, and then these next three on the right are just randomly vaccinating people. So if we vaccinate intelligently, we can do a little bit better than random. But in this setup, um, it wasn't an awful lot better. Um, and similarly for the uh, basically the intensity of the outbreak or how quickly it spread. Um, so there's some interesting things here. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, one of the big open questions, um, certainly that we still have is, how do we identify what these optimal strategies are? And how do they depend on the epidemiological context? And then the last thing that I want to bring up, and this is something that um, I'm really interested in looking at as well, is what do we do with the missing data? Um, so we know that the 469 people that we tracked during this study uh, was only a small fraction, about 5% of the entire population of this town. Um, what can we do to extrapolate from the behaviors and the interactions that we did see to the ones that we didn't see? Um, so in network science, um, there's uh, there's a reasonably well-studied network completion problem that is essentially this. Um, but there are some complexities in this particular framework, especially the wide sort of variance in the numbers of contacts that people have. Um, that makes this a bit more difficult than the standard problems that have been treated in network science so far. So this is something that we're really interested in taking forward as well, because I think that something like this would really help make these data um, a lot more applicable to more general contexts. Uh, so with that, I'd like to finish up. Um, again, I just want to highlight all of the collaborators who we've worked with on this project. Um, 360, Big Motive, 422, and BBC4, who were all part of the production team. Um, Julia, Maria, Petra, Andrew, Adam, and Hannah. Um, if you're interested in looking into these things more, there are a couple of uh, manuscripts and preprints out that are looking at various aspects of this study and things that I didn't have time to go into. Um, so you can look there for more information. Uh, and thank you all for your time and again to the organizers, and I'd be happy to take some questions now if there are any. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks so much. Um, so yeah, there is a question in the chat from Ellen. Um, so Ellen is asking, um, so it's interesting that targeting vaccination didn't make much difference. What did you assume about age specific, um, sorry, age -specific variation? Yeah, so with in the Hazelmere study, in this in this fine scale study, um, we ended up uh, for for the analyses that we did, we ended up uh, tossing out a lot of the age related information because again that uh, having since, since the number of participants was so small relatively, having age would have essentially made uh, a lot of the people identifiable. So we didn't assume anything in particular there uh, in terms of age. Uh, for vaccination, but I do think that that's that's a really important and interesting area for for further work. Um, it, we've done some some looking during the COVID nineteen pandemic about uh, age related vaccination efforts, of course, and um, yeah, I think I think that it's it's a really interesting question. Uh, we weren't able to get much insight into it from here, uh, but it's a question that I definitely have too. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and then we've got a question from Samuel Brand, if you want to unmute. Yes. Please, please. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, just a quick question. Um, so I've been working with the uh, Kenyan Ministry of Health and you sort of <coughs> sparked some memories by putting up the uh, Weslowski paper, which is quite a classic. Um, that one of the go to things uh, that they do um, in response to rising cases is to try and isolate main urban areas and discourage movements to and from them. Um, I guess I was wondering, you, I don't think you mentioned how effective you thought that was, or indeed what the best way to measure the effectiveness of that kind of policy is, because usually that's a kind of delay strategy rather than a reduction strategy to some extent. Um, yeah, and I guess the related question to that was, we had like a, the, the early estimates for SARS-CoV-2 of like R0 2.5 or higher sort of came out in like December 2019. So I was wondering, did anyone run the BBC pandemic model 
like just reset or not equal to 2.5 and just see what would happen i'm just that's just a general interest question yeah. rather than a science question thank you sure yeah thanks thanks for those questions yeah so um I think probably the place to look for some of those uh, questions is the manuscript in Epidemics, um, where uh, Petra was the lead author. Uh, so we did look some at uh, restricting the longer distance movements as well. Um, and it, as you say, that really does slow down the outbreak, even though it doesn't really reduce the total number of uh, cases that occur. Um, in the context of the UK, the big thing that that does is that that spares Scotland for a while, assuming that the epidemic starts in London, um, which, which could be a very important thing, you know, certainly if we're if we're trying to delay infections as much as we can. Um, and uh, we haven't published, I think, any of the work that looked at uh, more uh, SARS-CoV-2 like uh, reproduction numbers. Um, but I do know that some of that work was done um, I think with uh, with some of the groups that were working uh, with with the UK response, um, there may be some people on this call who I would be happy if they wanted to chime in as well if they used these data. I is, I, I had moved back to the states um, before the pandemic happened, and so I was not sort of directly involved in the UK response. But I, I do think that uh, that something like what you said, um, updating the reproduction number and some of the epidemiological parameters to match SARS-CoV-2 was done. But I don't think that we've published on those yet. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so sorry um, to Christopher and um, Cameron, um, just um, because we need to move on to the next talk, just because the, the, um, there's restrictions with the speaker timings. But Stephen will st um, be around for the discussion session at the end, so we'll pick up your questions then, if that's okay. Um, sure. So thank you so much, Stephen. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll carry on this discussion at, at four o'clock. Um, but for now, um, 